Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community worldwide, we are this week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1147 of this week in Amateur Radio. Amateur Radio Aries volunteers report to the wild weather conditions in the central and southern United States. We will have a full report. The ARRL extends the 2020 Pandemic Field Day rule waivers and adds a power restriction to Class D and E stations. We will have all the details. It looks like there is a green light for the Huntsville Ham Fest to take place this year, as well as the European version of Dayton in Friedrichshafen, Germany, both with pandemic restrictions in place. The ARRL Board of Directors considers a plan to cover the $35 FCC filing fee for some young members. The QSO Today Worldwide Virtual Ham Exposition taking place next month will have an extensive track dedicated to amateur satellite operations. We will fill in those details for you. The ARRL Board of Directors recognizes a trio of emergency service-oriented clubs. The Radio Society of Great Britain plans a fast-track exam to the full amateur license and sees a large surge in amateur radio license exams taking place during the pandemic lockdowns. We will have an announcement on one D expedition that is taking place and another that has been postponed. And the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio has sent a long-distance QSL to Mars. We will have the details in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will tell us about a very important out-of-cycle Windows 10 update and how one AT&T customer got upgraded internet service from the company almost instantly. It is an interesting story. Australia's own Anno Ben Shop, VK6FLAB, will help you out with ideas when you feel you are just running out of things to do with amateur radio. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill begins a two-part look at the history of the technician class license. And... Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will talk about the best way for you to haul cargo when climbing your tower. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, and enjoying the higher sun angles, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from along the southern shore of Lake Ontario in Rochester, New York, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, from the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And from our ham radio station in the Catskill Mountains, known as Ice Station Zebra, the temperatures finally crawled above 32 degrees. For the first time in weeks, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where the cross-country skis have been replaced by microspikes, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where it's looking like the North Pole around here lately, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Dave? Leading off the news this week, weather gone wild might be an apt description of the conditions in many parts of the U.S., with sub-freezing temperatures in areas not prepared for that sort of thing. Aberrant weather seems to be happening across many U.S. regions. Snow has fallen in Texas and Oklahoma, accompanied by record-setting temperature readings. Rick Lindquist at League Headquarters has been in touch with amateurs in Texas and other areas and files this special report from League Headquarters. Parts of the U.S. saw sub-freezing temperatures, snow and ice in areas not prepared for those sorts of things. 
That led to power and telecommunication outages. AWRL Amateur Radio Emergency Service volunteers in Texas were called up to fill the resulting communication gap. AWRL Emergency Response Director Paul Gilbert, KE5ZW, who lives in the Austin area, said Aries members were very, very, very busy with storm-related traffic. We've got about four inches of snow on the ground. Some people have as much as eight. We've got lots of ice. Power's been going on and off. The whole state is in a rolling blackout condition that I have no internet and uh, lots of other people don't have internet. The roads are very treacherous. The Aries team in Williamson County, where he lives, was among those activated a net to address power outages, vehicle accidents, health and welfare, and weather updates ran around the clock. Water shortages were reported too as pumping stations failed from a lack of power and frozen pipes. That was the big problem at week's end, getting drinkable water. Gilbert reported temperatures dipping into the record-setting single digits and overloaded emergency service. North Texas SEC Greg Evans, K5GTX, said the Grayson County Aries team activated to staff warming shelters and the Emergency Operations Center in Hill County was activated. New Mexico Section Emergency Coordinator Jay Miller, W5WHN, said stations checking in via HF and repeaters were reporting frozen water pipes. Hams were keeping an ear on the 7290 traffic net for any problems that might arise. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The National Weather Service says a weather system will help to create a new wave of low pressure in the Gulf of Mexico that will become the next winter storm to track across the lower Mississippi Valley and into the Ohio and Tennessee Valleys. A massive winter storm is moving across the Ohio Valley into the northeast bringing snow, sleet, and freezing rain, the National Weather Service said. Expect significant travels, disruptions, and power outages. Another winter storm will move into the south-central U.S., bringing another round of snow and ice. Arctic air with frigid temperatures and dangerous wind chills will persist over the central third of the U.S. this week. Chaves County Skywarn Coordinator Jim Tucker, KB0QNW, in southeast New Mexico, reported, We continue to experience rolling blackouts. I continue to monitor local and regional repeaters and systems, as well as the 7290 traffic net, should any need arise. I passed a message from Bowie, Texas to Clovis, New Mexico. Illinois Section Manager Tom Beebe, W9RY, reported no Aries activations, but the state got up to one foot of snow with drifting. Residents are being advised to stay home, given the sub-zero wind chill and hazardous driving conditions, Beebe said of his area, but he noted that other areas of Illinois are reporting similar conditions with even more snow and significant drifting. Alabama experienced a rare hard freeze overnight with light snow across the state, especially in the northwestern part of the state where some roads have been closed, said Alabama Section Emergency Coordinator David Gillespie, W4LHQ. He said power outages have occurred and temperatures remain below freezing. Roads are horrible, especially in south-central Indiana, was the report from Indiana Section Manager Jimmy Mary, KC9RPX, although no areas groups have been activated. He measured some nine inches of new snow with more than a foot already on the ground. So far, I haven't heard of any power outages, but a lot of accidents have occurred on the roads. Mary said the wind is supposed to pick up this afternoon, and he expects a lot of drifting. We are supposed to get some more significant snow in the next couple of days, he added. A strong, unseasonable tornado hit eastern North Carolina on February 15th, killing three and destroying homes near Ocean Isle Beach. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. The pandemic-modified AWRL field day rules from 2020 will continue this June with the addition of a power limit imposed on Class D home stations and Class E home stations emergency power participants. 
The news from the ARRL's Boards, Programs, and Services Committee comes as many clubs and groups are starting preparations for Field Day in earnest. Field Day 2021 will take place June 26th and 27th. This early decision should alleviate any hesitancy that radio amateur clubs and individual field day participants may have with their planning for the event, said ARRL contest manager Paul Baroque, N1 SFE. For field day 2021, Class D stations may work all other field day stations, including other Class D stations, for points. This year, however, Class D and Class E stations will be limited to 150 watts PEP output. An aggregate club score will be published just as it was done last year. The aggregate score will be a sum of all individual entries that attributed their score to that of a specific club. ARRL Field Day is one of the biggest events on the amateur radio calendar. Last summer, a record 10,213 entries were received. With the greater flexibility afforded by the rules waivers, individuals and groups will still be able to participate in Field Day while still staying within any public health recommendations and or requirements, Baroque said. The preferred method of submitting entries after field day is via the web applet. The ARRL field day rules include instructions on how to submit entries, which must be submitted or postmarked by Tuesday, July 27, 2021. The ARRL field day webpage contains complete rules and entry forms, as well as any updated information as it becomes available. You can also find the information on the ARRL field day Facebook page. If you'd like to go to a ham fest, I mean really go to an in-person ham fest, you'll get your chance this August at the Von Braun Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Some good news about ham radio conventions. On Tuesday, February 16th, it was announced that plans are going forward for the Huntsville ham fest. Mark Brown, N4BCD, the Huntsville ham fest chairman, made the following statement on the convention website, hamfest.org. The Hamfest Board has met with the Von Braun Center to learn about the current rules and regulations for mass gatherings. In short, the insurmountable objects that prevented us from hosting a Hamfest last year have relaxed to the point where we can host a safe and successful event. Additionally, our survey of commercial and flea market vendors on their plans to attend returned very encouraging sentiments. Adjustments to the floor plan are being made to keep everybody safe, in particular 12-foot aisle spacings. Additionally, space will be utilized this year to accommodate the commercial and flea market vendors and visitors. Once the floor plan has been defined in a few weeks, we'll open the web portal up for vendor registration. We highly recommend that visitors purchase tickets online this year. We'll call windows will be set up to streamline the Saturday morning crush. The ticket web portal will be open in a few weeks. The Hamfest board is excited at the prospect of holding a live gathering in a safe way for everyone attending, and we look forward to seeing many of our friends again. The Huntville Ham Fest is a world-class ham radio gathering since 1993. Mark your calendars for this one. At its annual meeting in January, the ARRL Board of Directors considered a motion to offer a new plan that would pay the new but not yet implemented $35 FCC application fee for a limited number of new radio amateurs younger than age 18 who, at the time of testing, belonged to an ARRL-affiliated 501c3 charitable organization and passed their tests through an ARRL volunteer examiner coordinator sponsored exam session. The proposal called for reducing the VEC fee for these candidates to $5. The initial proposal came from ARRL Southeastern Division Director Mickey Baker, N4MB. Other board members offered subsidiary motions. Supporters said the purpose behind the motion was to ameliorate the potential financial hardship the pending FCC application fee posed on certain minors applying for their first license and to encourage new youth membership. Considerations of the motion, which was subject to considerable discussion, was deferred to an ad hoc committee composed of the members of the Administration and Finance Committee, two members of the Programs and Services Committee, and ARRL Chief Executive Officer David Minster, NA2AA, or his designated representative. The board directed the panel to review and more fully develop the proposal and report back to the board by the end of March with a recommendation as to whether the program should be adopted and, if adopted, how it should be implemented. 
Supporters express the belief that recruitment and training of young radio amateurs is a necessary and proper mission of the ARRL and that subsidizing the $35 fee will reduce the number of new amateurs that otherwise would be lost from these groups. In December, the FCC agreed with ARRL and other commenters that the initially proposed $50 fee for certain radio amateur applications was too high to account for the minimal staff involvement in these applications. In a report and order, the FCC scaled back to $35 the fee for a new license application, a special temporary authority request, a rule waiver request, a license renewal application, and a vanity call sign application. All fees are per application. There will be no fee for administrative updates, such as a change of mailing or email address. As the FCC noted in its report and order, although some commenters supported the proposed $50 fee as reasonable and fair, ARRL and many other individual commenters argued that there was no cost-based justification for the application fees in the amateur radio service. After reviewing the record, including the extensive comments filed by amateur radio licensees and based on our revised analysis of the cost of processing mostly automated processes discussed in our methodology section, we adopt a $35 application fee a lower application fee than the Commission proposed in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking for Personal Licenses in recognition of the fact that the application process is mostly automated, the FCC said in the R&O. No fee would apply to minor modifications or administrative updates, which the FCC noted are highly automated. The FCC turned away the arguments of some commenters that the FCC should exempt amateur radio licensees. The FCC stated that it has no authority to create an exemption where none presently exists. The FCC also disagreed with those who argued that amateur radio licensees should be exempt from fees because of their public service contribution during emergencies and disasters. The FCC has directed the Office of Managing Director, in consultation with relevant offices and bureaus, to draft a notice for publication in the Federal Register announcing when rule changes will become effective once the relevant databases, guides, and internal procedures have been updated. The largest in-person ham fest in Europe, Ham Radio in Friedrichshafen, Germany, was cancelled last year because of the pandemic. Organizers for Europe's International Amateur Radio Exhibition this week expressed optimism that the 45th Ham Radio, sponsored by the Deutscher Amateur Radio Club, will be able to take place June 25th through the 27th. We are watching the situation closely, of course, a message from Friedrichshafen Fairgrounds CEO Klaus Wellman said. At the moment, we are assuming that we will be able to hold ham radio in accordance with an extensive, tried and proven safety and hygiene concept and are looking forward to seeing everyone again at Europe's most important trade fair for amateur radio. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo on March 13th and 14th, 2021, will devote a speaker track to AMSAT and the world of amateur radio satellites. The Expo is in full planning mode and promises many exciting new things for the upcoming event, which will include a world-class lineup of more than 60 speakers and workshops for beginners to experts. Presenters at nine AMSAT sessions will discuss the broad spectrum of ham radio satellites, including Introduction to Amateur Radio Satellites with Douglas Quagliana, KA2UPW, Getting on the Air with Satellites, presented by Clint Bradford, K6LCS, How to Enjoy Amateur Radio Contacts with the International Space Station, hosted by Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, Implementation of LDPC Encoder, on FPGA and Debris Mitigation in Earth Orbit, both presented by Anshul Makar. Digital Multiplexing Transponder from the Open Research Institute with Michelle Thompson, W5NYV. Solving the ITAR 
and EAR problems for the Amateur Radio Satellite Service, again with Michelle Thompson, W5NYV, and Remote Labs for P4XT Engineering Development, presented by Paul Williamson, KB5MU. Thompson, an AMSAT board member, said working satellites is one of the most rewarding privileges of holding an amateur radio license. There has never been a better time to be involved in amateur radio satellites, since some long-standing regulatory burdens have been lifted, and advanced technology has never been more affordable and accessible, Thompson remarked. We have opportunities now that were not available as of even a few years ago. AMSAT is fortunate to contribute to the Expo by showcasing the truly amazing work going on around the world in the amateur satellite scene. And the Expo is an ideal partner to show it off to the wider ham audience. AMSAT will have a booth at the Expo where attendees can talk to experts, enthusiasts, operators, and technicians and obtain contact and membership information for the 30 AMSAT societies around the world. Early bird tickets to the Ham Expo are $10, which go to help cover the cost of this event, and $12.50 at the door. The entry fee includes entry for the live two-day event, as well as access during the 30-day on-demand period following the event. Register on the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo website. The ARRL has told the FCC that no additional volunteer examiner coordinators are needed to oversee the administration of amateur radio exams by volunteer examiners. With more details on the League's response to the FCC, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who is standing by at League headquarters with this report. Examination opportunities have continued to be widely available throughout the U.S., except for a couple of months during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and adding VECs to the 14 now in place would, ARRL said, have no effect on the number of available exams. ARRL's comments on February 4th were in response to a January 5th FCC public notice seeking input on possible expansion of the VEC pool. ARRL said it found that even though 10 of the 12 months for calendar year 2020 were times of severe disruption throughout the nation, amateur examination opportunities and numbers were strong. Instead of increasing the number of VECs, ARRL encouraged volunteers to become accredited as volunteer examiners and to volunteer to help the current VECs wherever possible. ARRL noted that VEs, not VECs, are responsible for administering amateur radio exams. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. In response to the Commission's notice in WT Docket 21-2, the ARRL reviewed the amateur examination numbers for the past five years, including the pandemic period, ARRL said in its comments. Multiple web-based exam opportunities are available across the U.S., even on short notice, and in-person examinations are available in many areas where local regulation and special safety requirements allow. It has never been easier, ARRL asserted, noting that exam sessions often are available within two days, but rarely more than seven if taking advantage of a remote, web-based exam opportunity. ARRL Volunteer Examiner Coordinator, the nation's largest, has 30,000 accredited VEs, with 11,000 of them regularly participating in exam activities on a weekly or monthly basis. The number of new and upgraded licenses has been in line with earlier years with noticeable increases in the four months following the lockdown that occurred in many areas in the early spring, ARRL pointed out. New FCC licenses issued in January 2021 number 2,838 compared with 2,058 for a year earlier. Upgrades were also up significantly, 920 in January 2021 to 554 for the same month last year. 
The 14 separate and independent FCC-approved VECs readily accredit additional VEs whenever and wherever needed, ARRL concluded. Increasing the number of individual VECs would have no discernible benefit. Instead, ARRL said, increasing the number of VECs would expand the complexity of VEC coordination and management, increase demand on FCC resources to interface with additional organizations, and raise the potential for abuse and fraud. As reported on SpaceWeather.com, Canadian radio amateur Scott Tilley, VE7TIL, has snagged another signal from deep space. His latest conquest has been to copy the signal from China's Tianwen-1 probe, which went into orbit around Mars on February 10th. Tilly told SpaceWeather.com that the probe's X-band signal was loud and audible. It was a treasure hunt, Tilly told SpaceWeather.com. He explained that while the spacecraft did post its frequency with the International Telecommunications Union, it was too vague for precise tuning. X-band is between 8 gigahertz and 12 gigahertz. Launched last July, Tianwen-1 represents China's first Mars mission. It consists of an orbiter and a rover, which will land on the Martian surface in May or June 2021. It is able to photograph the planet's surface while in orbit. Finding signals from deep space is a sub-hobby for Tilly, who seeks what he calls zombie satellites among other signal sources. In 2020, he tracked and identified signals from the experimental UHF military communications satellite LESS-5. Tilly said he found the satellite in what he called a geostationary graveyard orbit after noting a modulated carrier on 236.7487 MHz. Launched in 1967, LESS-5 was supposed to shut down in 1972, but it continues to operate as long as its solar panels are facing the sun, Tilly explained. In 2018, while hunting for an undisclosed U.S. government spacecraft lost in a launch mishap, he spotted the signature of IMAGE, or Imager for Magnetopause to Aurora Global Exploration, a NASA spacecraft believed to have died in December 2005. The discovery delighted space scientists. Tilly also has picked up signals from NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter and the United Arab Emirates Hope Probe, both orbiting Mars some 124 million miles away. He uses a homemade 60-centimeter dish and relies on software-defined radios to accomplish the task. Radio amateurs have been listening for signals from space since the 1957 launch of Sputnik 1, which transmitted at around 20 megahertz. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California, This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Emergency fix for Windows, KB5001028. Well, they call it an out-of-band update. You know, normally only Windows patches come out on the second Tuesday of the month. Here we are, halfway through the month, day before Valentine's Day, and already an emergency fix. You might want this if you have been getting the blue screen of death every time you connect to a Wi-Fi network. Actually, it's the new WPA3 Wi-Fi networks. So probably a lot of people aren't experiencing this. WPA is the encryption on your Wi-Fi that keeps other people from seeing what you're doing. You should have that turned on. The old one was WEP, but that was broken very, <laughs> very early on. So that got replaced with WPA. Then there was WPA1 and then WPA2. But WPA2 got hacked or cracked. Not an easy crack, but still a crack. So uh, Wi-Fi access points and so forth are upgrading now to WPA3. Not enough of them out there, and that's probably why Microsoft missed this bug. But when you attempt to connect to a WPA3 Wi-Fi network, and they do exist, you will get a blue screen of death crash. Ooh. Ooh, a stop error 0x7e in the nwifi.sys with a blue screen. <laughs> You're more likely to encounter it, encounter it when reconnecting to Wi-Fi after disconnecting or upon waking for sleep or hibernation. Most Wi-Fi networks still on WPA2, so that's probably why a lot of people haven't seen this. Anyway, just thought I'd mention that. In case you've been getting that blue screen of death, there is a patch. And if you're, you know, on Windows, you're getting the patch and you perhaps you're wondering why. Now you know. Everybody does this. Apple does it. Everybody does this. These things happen. 
I love the story of Aaron Epstein, or is it Epstein, Aaron? I don't know. He uh, He's in North Hollywood, and uh, he was very disappointed with his internet access. He could, he, you know, AT&T only was giving him something like three megabits down, which is not unusual when you have a DSL network. He called and called. He finally ended up getting Spectrum cable internet, but he, but he wanted AT&T to do right by him. So what did, <laughs> what did he do? <laughs> he took out an ad in the Wall Street Journal for $10,000. <laughs> A quarter page ad in the Wall Street Journal, paid advertisement, open letter to Mr. John T. Stanky, CEO AT&T. Dear Mr. Stanky, AT&T prides itself as a leader in electronic communications. Unfortunately for the people who live in North Hollywood, California, 91607, AT&T is now a major disappointment. You go, Aaron. <laughs> He's 90 years old, by the way. I think this is the case that you get spicier as you get older. I think that's the case. I notice I'm getting a little spicier in my old age. <laughs> Many of our neighbors are creative technical workers at Universal Warner Brothers Disney in the adjacent city of Burbank. We need to keep up with technology. In AT&T, we're looking to AT&T to supply us with fast internet service. Their advertising speeds up to 100 megabits for other neighborhoods the fastest now available to us from at&t is only three megabits that you can't do anything you can't watch netflix you basically it's hard to surf even at three megabits you can get email and if you're patient you can surf the internet your competitors now have speeds over 200 megabits why is at&t a leading communications company treating us so shabbily in north hollywood Aaron M. Epstein, an ATT customer since 1960. And you know he is because his email address is at pacbell.net, which is at least 20 years old and hasn't been Pacific Bell in a long, long time. $10,000 he paid for that ad. Good on you, Mr. Epstein. Good on you. Of course, ATT responded. <laughs> it's not, it's never good to see your, <laughs> see your CEO's name. In uh, in the Wall Street Journal, even if it's just an ad, it's never good. And in fact, they called him that day. They upgraded his internet almost right away. They said, "Yeah, we got the whole neighborhood." They didn't. They didn't. Uh, they still don't. Because you know what? It's expensive wiring neighborhoods for uh, for fiber. You got to trench out. They said we've got the fiber out to the neighborhood, but not to the houses. It's expensive, and and even. Uh, Mr. Epstein said, yeah, they said it was going to cost a lot to do this, but they did it. <laughs> the AT&T people I talked to tell me they had to install extra wiring. It's costing them thousands and thousands of dollars. Oh, AT&T, thousands and thousands of dollars. Oh, what did AT&T uh, make this year? $171 billion in revenue in 2020. <laughs> it's costing us thousands. <laughs> And, and Mr. Epstein, I know you're old enough to remember this. What is this that Ernst, Ernestine, the telephone operator, used to say on laughing? We're the phone company. We don't care. We don't have to. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Mr. Epstein's neighbors are waiting with anxious, anxiously. Epstein still has his spectrum, he says, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal. No, I'm sorry. This is Ars Technica, an Ars Technica article. He says... Uh, Charter got in touch after the hubbub last week to provide him with a better modem. Don't take out an ad for, against us, please. When at and installed fiber, Epstein had the at and technician set things up so he can easily switch back and forth between at and and Spectrum to compare them. Maybe if a month from now, if I'm satisfied using at and only I'll drop Spectrum. <laughs> I love it. It's, it is in a, a constant source of of annoyance that here we are in the country where the internet was invented, perfected, first widely used, that uh, we still kind of have uh, among the worst internet access in the world at the highest prices, by the way. And, uh, you know, I think some of that, to, to be really scrupulously fair, some of that is because we have the, you know, we've been doing it for so long. A lot of times when you have a, you know, an entrenched long time existing infrastructure it's hard to do the big upgrade 
you know, you're, we, we, we have, you know, cell stru- system, terrible. We were the last country probably in the world to do SMS messaging because we had all these different systems. That's what happens. And we have a lot of different systems, but I think it also, you can blame a little bit. You can blame, um, the FCC and these big telecoms because they've kind of colluded to give themselves essentially monopolies in every district. You know, Mr. Epstein only has two choices, the phone company and the cable company. That might change soon, soon. Competition is what keeps prices down, what keeps innovation up. And, uh, you know, historically, these companies have eliminated competition, getting the federal government to say, no, no competition allowed here. You, you know, you own it. It's a monopoly, regional monopoly. But uh, they, that was with landlines, line ter- terrestrial service. Now, Elon Musk has Spacelink going up. They've started to take pre-orders. Now, it's not going to be cheap, $90 a month, but you can't, you know, the satellites, you can't, you can't stop them. So uh, maybe a little competition. That would be good. You know, we started to see AT&T and Verizon roll out fiber at lower costs when Google got into the mix. But Google quickly realized it was not a good business and got out of it. That's when Verizon said, yeah, we're not going to do it either. (laughs) Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a direct download on our website at www.twiar.net. The technician license is, by far, the most popular class of license now held in the amateur community. So many new hams started at the technician level to the extent that the novice license was eliminated as unnecessary. The amateur community accepts the technician as an acceptable mainstream license, either as a stepping stone to a higher class license or as an end in itself. But it wasn't always like this. For the first 25 years of the technician class license existence, it was an official outcast set apart by the FCC as separate and distinct from the other amateur classes. Why were technicians considered second class? To answer this question, we must go back to 1951. On July 1st, 1951, the FCC replaced the Class A, B, and C licenses with the Advanced, General, and Conditional classes and created three new licenses, the Extra, Technician, and Novice. The FCC was specific about the purpose of the technician class license as shown in the following quote. This class was established expressly for serious-minded experimenters who need spectrum space in which to air test their equipment. It was not established as a communication service and should not be regarded as a stepping stone between the novice and the general operator classes. The technician class of amateur license has as its purpose the provision for the serious-minded amateur experimenters to explore the higher frequencies and otherwise contribute to the art. Thus, the technician was an experimenter, not a communicator. For this reason, the FCC initially allowed technicians privileges only on frequencies above 220 megacycles. The FCC did not intend for the technician to engage in casual conversations on the air. Other than allowing the technician to simultaneously hold a novice license, which at that time was valid for only one year and non-renewable, it was expected that the technician operator would stick to experimentation, not communication. Although many of the early technicians were indeed pure experimenters, many others obtained the license as a means to communicate without having to pass the 13 words per minute code test. These technician communicators became restless with the limited frequencies available above 220 megacycles, and they wanted access to the more mainstream VHF bands at 6 and 2 meters. They were joined by a small number of technician experimenters who also wished access to 50 and 144 megacycles for the purpose of studying sporadic e-skip, building equipment for these bands, or even using their license for radio control. 
Thus, in early 1955, a proposal was submitted to the FCC to allow technicians access to 6 and 2 meters. Knowing that the FCC regarded the license as an experimental one, these proposals avoided mentioning communication. Rather, phrases such as greater experimentation were used. The ARRL supported technician access to 6, but not 2 meters. In announcing their decision, the ARRL stated that 6 meters was far less occupied than 2 meters and could use the influx of technicians to study the band and thus contribute to the greater understanding of the unique characteristics of 50 megacycles. The ARRL went on to say that permitting technicians on 2 meters would appear to make the technician license too attractive. Many amateurs also wrote the FCC on this. Some said that technicians should have the full access to all frequencies above 50 megacycles, while others opposed the move, citing the FCC's original intent for this license and expressing fears that by allowing technicians to use 6 and 2 meters, they would become mere communicators. On April 12, 1955, the FCC amended Part 12, not Part 97, of the rules and regulations to give the technician class operator 6 but not two meters. The fears of those opposed to technician communicators were amplified in 1958 when, at the peak of the sunspot cycle, thousands of technicians used F layer skip on 50 megacycles to work vast amounts of DX, with some earning the Worked All States Award. Nevertheless, allowing technicians on six meters had a beneficial effect. It helped populate a band that was underutilized and it allowed a greater study of E and F layer skip. For this reason, early in 1959, another proposal was submitted to the FCC to allow technicians full access to the 144 megacycle band. This time the ARRL agreed. They stated that things had changed since 1955, and technicians on 2 meters would benefit not only the advancement of the radio art, but would also allow all classes of amateur licenses to share at least one voice band in common, as novices had access to the 145 through 147 megacycle segment of 2 meters. Despite the ARRL's support of technicians on 2 meters, there was opposition. Again, the argument as to the purpose of the license was brought up. Many amateurs wrote to the FCC stating that a technician was an experimenter, not a communicator, and that the license should not be used for routine exchange of communications. One ham complained that technicians were rag-chewing and not experimenting. A few amateurs not only wanted technicians kept off of 144 megacycles, but asked the FCC to incorporate their statement as to the purpose of the license into Part 12, presumably so that technicians caught communicating rather than experimenting could be fined or have their licenses suspended. Others, including the ARRL, did bring in valid experimental reasons to allow technicians on two meters. Once again, the FCC compromised. They restated their official position that a technician was an experimenter, not a communicator. However, they acknowledged that VHF studies could be made on two meters and that it was beneficial to have one common meeting ground for all classes of license. Thus, on August 21, 1959, Part 12 was amended to allow technicians access to the 145 through 147 megacycle segment of 2 meters, the same subband that the novices had. And so, technicians entered the 1960s as a distinctly second-class license. They were not eligible for racy station authorizations. They could not hold many ARRL appointments. And, despite the ARRL support of full technician access to all frequencies above 50 megacycles, the FCC's official position had not changed. Although no technician was actually ever fined or suffered a license suspension for the crime of communicating, many hams felt that technicians were merely glorified CBers who were violating the spirit, if not the letter of the law. In our next installment, we will see how a new, short-lived VHF magazine and an official change in the ARRL's viewpoint helped to bring about a gradual acceptance of technicians as real amateurs. I hope to see you then. The French Defence Ministry has a tender out for radio jamming equipment that can be drone mounted. Jamming is the act of producing interfering signals, deliberately designed to prevent another signal on the same channel being heard.
Jamming is quite common on the shortwave broadcast bands, where some countries aim to prevent their citizens from hearing broadcasts they consider to be subversive. But this appears to be a military application. The French government's Defence Innovation Agency has put out a request for proposals in search of a small, low-power warfare device that can find radio communication transmitters while mounted on a fixed or rotary wing drone and possibly disable the signals through jamming. Proposals were due no later than the 18th of January and demonstrations of prototypes will follow over the course of the next seven months. The devices are expected to be capable of detecting any number of transmitters operating between 30 MHz and 6 GHz and able to transmit their findings in real time to a receiving station on the ground. Bidding is being limited to companies within the European Union. Originating from Albany, New York, and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. Imagine this. You have just encountered an intense cyclone, a storm so strong that it has damaged buildings, uprooted trees, brought down electricity poles and power lines, and destroyed everything in its path. The electricity is already down, and your usual modes of communication, cell phones, landlines, the internet, have all stopped functioning. What do you do in such a situation? How do you make those emergency calls for medical assistance? How do you seek immediate help after being completely cut off from the rest of the world? So asked Weather.com, which featured amateur radio relief efforts during disasters as part of their recognition of World Radio Day 2021. Ankur Puranik, an Indian radio ham, was interviewed for the article. Ankur said that owing to its sheer effectiveness, coupled with the fact that ham operators offer their noble service on a strictly voluntary basis, governments around the world have wasted no time in adding ham radio into their disaster management plans and emergency contact lists. The Weather.com article continued, be it natural disasters like cyclones and earthquakes, or human-made ones like bomb blasts or terror attacks. The loss of communication in such times can often push a delicate situation from bad to worse. It can often be the difference between life and death. But even in such desperate circumstances, a glimmer of hope can be found, and contact with the outside world can be established through a mode of communication that many wrongly believe to be obsolete – radio. On the occasion of the 2021 World Radio Day, an international United Nations observance held on February the 13th every year, the Weather.com article explores the underappreciated yet crucial role played by amateur radio and the volunteers that operate it in saving lives during calamities. Anka Puranik concluded his interview by saying that ham operators will continue to communicate vital information in times of greatest need. You can read the full article, which contains a lot of detail, at weather.com. The full web link is available under this item on the Southgate Amateur Radio Club website at southgatearc.org. And also celebrating World Radio Day, the latest issue of the free International Telecommunications Union news magazine features two articles on amateur radio. It features ham radio and emergency comms, filling the United States Geological Survey donut hole by Adam Davidson, Whiskey 3 Alpha Sierra, and why World Amateur Radio Day is key to highlighting crucial services by IARU President Tim Ellum, Victor Echo 6 Sierra Hotel. There's also an interesting article called A Deep Dive into the Evolution of Radio Through the Ages. To download your free copy, Go to www.itu.int and navigate to the Publications section. This is W2XBS with the propagation forecast for Saturday, February 20th, 2021. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, reports that a period of zero sunspots ran from February 4th all the way to the 17th. But this past Wednesday evening, while viewing the stereo spacecraft image, he saw a very bright area on our sun's northeast horizon. Shortly after, spaceweather.com reported a new active region which is hiding just behind the sun's northeastern limb. It might be a sunspot. The next day, February 18th, two new sunspot regions appeared in our sun's northern hemisphere, numbered 2802 and 2803. Region 2802 should soon rotate off the visible solar disk, and 2803 is the region just now crossing the eastern solar horizon. Space weather is currently warning us to expect a minor geomagnetic storm on February 21st, 
triggered by a solar wind stream. The average daily solar flux this week dropped from 72.8 to 72. Average daily planetary A indices were unchanged from last week and remained steady at 7.7. .7. Reported cracks in the Earth's magnetic field on Tuesday allowed solar wind to pour in, sparking aurora from the Arctic Circle. Alaska's College A index jumped to 45, which is a very high number, after the K index hit 7 at 0600 and 0900 UTC. This is from a single magnetometer located near Fairbanks. The predicted solar flux for the next 15 days is 71 on February 20th and 21st, 70 on February 22nd through the 26th, 73, 74, and 73 on February 27th to March 1st, respectively, 74 on March 2nd and 3rd, and 73 on March 4th and 6th. The predicted planetary A in dice is 8, 18, 12, and 10 on February 20th to the 23rd, 5 on February 24th to the 28th, 18, 15, and 8 on March 1st to the 3rd, and 5 on March 4th and 5th. Time now for the AMSAT report. Here's a quick heads up if you find a new satellite in orbit and you'd like to add the Keplerian elements to your current list of KEPs, do your editing in Notepad or similar as opposed to a word processor such as MS Word. Notepad does not add any line feeds or other extraneous characters to your file that may not be recognized by the program trying to process your KEPs leading to errors. Looking into the Wayback Machine, it was five years ago the W1AW Stroke 4 was operating on SO50 from Orlando Hamcation. Ten years ago, AO51 had stopped transmitting, but was successfully recovered by control ops. The MSAT report comes to us each week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. The University of Louisiana at Lafayette student-built CAPE-3 satellite was launched on January 17th. A 1U CubeSat, CAPE-3 includes a Digipeter and experimental UHF adaptive radio. An AX25 telemetry downlink has been coordinated on 145.825 MHz and a 1K2 frequency shift keying downlink has been coordinated on 435.325 MHz, which may burst to 100 kHz bandwidth according to the International Amateur Radio Union Amateur Satellite Coordination page. CAPE-3 is the third CUBE satellite in the CAPE series. The primary educational mission is to allow grade school classrooms to access the smartphone CubeSat classroom and run interactive experiments through an experimental smartphone ground station grid. The secondary mission is to perform scientific experiments involving radiation detection and take pictures of Earth. The solar-powered spacecraft, created by the University of Louisiana at Lafayette's CAPE satellite team, was launched with nine other CubeSats as part of NASA's Educational Launch of Nanosatellites program. A Virgin Orbit Launcher 1 rocket attached beneath a wing of a customized Boeing 747 was dropped high above the Pacific Ocean. It climbed about 225 miles above Earth and then ejected the satellites. The CAPE satellites are named for the university's Cajun Advanced Pico Satellite Experiment Program designed to prepare students for careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields. This Week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly National Worldwide Amateur Radio News Service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to 
W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. Now celebrating our 22nd year keeping the amateur radio community informed, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. Foundations of Amateur Radio. So, there's nothing on TV, the bands are dead, nobody's answering your CQ, you're bored and it's all too hard. You've run out of things to try. There's only so many different ways to use the radio and it's all too much. I mean, you've only got CW, AM, SSB, FM. There's upper and lower sideband. Then there's Ritty, the all too popular FT8. Then there's Whisper. But then you run out of things. I mean, right? What about PSK31, SSTV? Then there's Amtor, Hellschreiber, Clover, Olivia, Thor, MFSK, Contestia, the longtime favourites of Echolink and RLP. Not to forget Fusion, DMR, D-Star, All-Star, Brandmeister, or APRS. So far, I've mentioned about 20 modes, picked at random, some from the list of modes that the software FL Digi supports. Some of these don't even show up on the Signal Wiki, which has a list of about 70 amateur modes. With all the bands you have available, there's plenty of different things to play with, all the time. There's contests for many of them, so once you've got it working, you can see how well you go. Over the past year I've been experimenting with a friend with various modes, some more successful than others. I'm mentioning this because it's not difficult to get started. Seriously, it's not. The most important part of this whole experiment is getting your computer to talk to your radio. If you have FT8 already working, you have all the hardware in place. To make the software work, you can't go past installing FL Digi. As a tool, it works a lot like what you're familiar with. You'll see a band scope, a list of frequencies, and a list of decodes. It's one of many programs that can decode and generate a multitude of amateur digital modes. If this is all completely new to you, don't be alarmed. There are essentially two types of connections between your computer and your radio. The first one is audio. The second is control. For this to work well, both these need to be two-way, so you can both decode the audio that the radio receives and generate audio that the radio can transmit. The same is true for the control connection. You need to be able to set the transmit frequency and the mode, and you need to be able to read the current state of the radio, if only to toggle the transmitter on and off. If you already have cat control working, that's one half done. I've spoken with plenty of amateurs who are reluctant to do any of this. If this is you, don't be afraid. It's like the first time you keyed up your radio. Remember the excitement? You can relive that experience no matter how long you've been an amateur. Depending on the age of your radio, you might find that there's only one physical connection between your computer and the radio, either using USB or even Ethernet. You'll find that your computer will still need to deal with the two types of information separately. Notice that I've not talked about what kind of operating system you need to be running. I use and prefer Linux, but you can do this on any operating system, even using a mobile phone, if that takes your fancy. Getting on air and making noise using your microphone is one option, but doing this using computer control will open you to scores of new adventures. I will add some words of caution here. In general, especially using digital modes, less is more. If you drive the audio too high, you'll splatter all over the place and nobody will hear you. Well, actually everyone will, but nobody will be able to talk to you because they won't be able to decode it. If the ALC on your radio is active, you're too loud. WSJTX, the tool for modes like FT8 and Whisper, has a really easy way of ensuring that your levels are right. So, if you've not done anything yet, start there. Another issue is signal isolation. What I mean by that is you blowing up the computer because the RF traveled unexpectedly back up the serial or audio cable and caused all manner of grief. You can get all fancy with optical isolation, and at some point you should, but until then, dial the power down to QRP levels, 5 watts, and you'll be fine. 
A third issue that was likely covered during your licensing is the duty cycle. It's the amount of time that your radio is transmitting continuously as compared to receiving only. For some modes, like Whisper, for example, you'll be transmitting for a full two minutes at 100%, so you'll be working your radio hard. Even harder might unexpectedly be using FT8, which transmits in 15 second bursts every 15 seconds, so there may not be enough time for your radio to cool down. Investing in a fan is a good plan, but being aware of the issue will go a long way to keeping the magic smoke inside your radio. I'm sure that you have plenty of questions after all that. You can ask your friends or drop me an email, cq at vk6flab.com, and I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Next time there's nothing good on TV, get on air and make some digital noise. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Organisers of the popular Friedrichshafen Amateur Radio Trade Show next to Lake Constance in Germany are still planning for the event to take place on June the 25th to the 27th later this year. In a press release, the organisers said that after it was not possible for the International Amateur Radio Exhibition to take place last year due to the coronavirus pandemic, the trade fair organisers are optimistic that this year they will be able to provide a meeting place for the industry. With the German National Society, DARC, as a sponsor, the scene is being set for the 45th staging of the ham radio gathering. Friedrich Schaffen CEO, Klaus Wellmann, said that they are watching the situation closely. At the moment, the organisers are assuming that they will be able to hold the event in accordance with an extensive, tried and proven safety and hygiene concept, and they are looking forward to seeing everyone again. There will be a new hall layout for various reasons. One of the halls is currently being used as a COVID vaccination centre, and another is temporary home to Friedrich Schaffen's volleyball team, as their own arena was closed due to structural defects. Therefore, commercial exhibitors and associations will be occupying halls A3 and A4, and radio amateurs will be able to make exciting discoveries at the flea markets in Hall B1 and B2. In this way, there'll be plenty of space available for both exhibitors and visitors. Instead of delivering to an audience in a conference room, presentations will be transmitted via video stream. This year, the event will again be presenting a wide range of measuring instruments, antennas and electrical engineering equipment. However, there will be inevitable changes compared to previous years. For example, the number of live presentations is being reduced. There'll be no youth camp and no ham rally. This time, tickets can only be purchased online. For visitors, the trade fair also offers the option of staying overnight on a parking lot for RVs and caravans close to the exhibition. Friedrich Schaffen runs from Friday, June the 25th to Sunday, June the 27th. It'll be open on Friday and Saturday from 9am to 6pm and on Sunday from 9am to 3pm. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, iHeartMedia, and Spotify. The RSGB's Examination Standards Committee in the UK is launching the consultation to ask for views of the amateur radio community on a new direct-to-full license exam that would run in parallel with the existing three-tier system. The consultation is expected to start at 10.15 GMT Wednesday, February 17th, and run until Sunday, March 14th. The background to this consultation and a link to the proposed syllabus should be on the RSGB website at www.rsgb.org. There have been calls for a direct of full exam in the UK for many years. The RSGB's Training and Education Committee formally proposed it in 2010, and early indications are it may prove popular. The United Kingdom's current system forces people to go through three separate exam sessions to get a full license. Under the new proposal, people would be free to choose to do the short online foundation course initially to get their foundation license, and then study and do the direct to full exam online, completely bypassing the intermediate stage. This should produce a savings in exam fees, and hopefully may mean less exam stress. As a successful direct to full candidate will receive the HAREC qualification, the online exam may prove of interest to people outside the British Islands. There are a number of countries in Africa and even Europe where it can be difficult and even impossible to access amateur radio training or exams. Being able to access online training and get the internationally recognized HREC qualification online may help the would-be amateur 
to get licenses in those countries. This new exam will no doubt remind old-timers of the City and Guild's radio amateur exam, which took people straight to full license, either A or B. Meanwhile, the challenge of the pandemic has stirred unprecedented interest in amateur radio. As the crisis kept most of the country immobilized, last year, the Radio Society of Great Britain rolled out remote invigilation of license exams. Now, some of the free popular distance learning programs are reporting a surge in applicants for the foundation license and then upgrading exam training. Approaching the 17th February application deadline, the Bath-based distance learning team said its new full license course has had overwhelming response. Team leader Steve Hartley, G0FUW, said in an email that with 100 spaces available, the class was already oversubscribed as organizers sort through some 250 inquiries. This exceeds the previous annual registration for the course, one of several offered by the Bath and District Amateur Radio Club. Some of the registrants for the full license class are those who had trained in its intermediate class. In another email, RSGB President Dave Wilson, M0OBW, praised those providing online training, saying the Society website offers a list of these groups. RSGB Communications Manager Heather Parsons added that having more time to devote to radio now was the only reason among many given for the upsurge in interest. In Nottingham, the South Knowles Amateur Radio Club said enrollment for its foundation, intermediate and full license online training course, has likewise attracted high levels of applicants. Club Secretary Simon Strange, M0SYS, said that he now has lead training three nights of the week to meet the intense demand. He said the classes include men, women, and children. ARRL Life member Ulrich Road, N1UL, has donated a Road & Schwarz SMBV100A vector signal generator to the ARRL laboratory. With more details on this exciting new addition to the ARRL laboratory, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from ARRL headquarters. The device offers internal signal generation for all major digital radio standards. ARRL CEO David Minster, NA2AA, called it absolutely fabulous news and extremely generous. ARRL lab manager Ed Hare, W1RFI, said the instrument will be a valuable addition to the lab, allowing it to do more comprehensive tests on modern radios, almost all of which use software-defined radio technology. The lab also will be able to test receivers' digital capabilities. Rhoda said vector signal generators are the logical successors to the older AM-FM modulation-capable signal generators. Some tests required to characterize SDRs need different test equipment, he said. The SMBV100A has a built-in arbitrary waveform generator capable of operating up to 6 gigahertz with many complex signals in its library. Instead of a two-tone test signal, say, for measuring IF characteristics, the SMBV100A can generate up to 30 discrete tones. Rhoda said it can produce any signal as long as you can describe it mathematically, even an FT8 signal. The bottom line is a more realistic test result. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Harris said he was looking forward to learning more about this SMBV100A once it's installed at the lab. The potential is really exciting, he said. As always, we appreciate the support that Ehrlich Road has given to the lab over the past several decades. Rhodes said that in 1982, while he headed the Department of Defense Radio Division at RCA, he and his engineering group invented what is now called the software-defined radio, which was considered classified military information at the time. Here's the listing of upcoming ARRL Learning Network webinars. These webinars are members-only benefit. Visit the website for a complete listing and to view previously recorded webinars. Talking to Astronauts an elementary school's exciting ARIS experience, hosted by Diane Warner, KE8HLD. This is a story about Talmage Elementary School's participation in a once-in-a-lifetime amateur radio on the International Space Station School Contact. Learn about their amazing journey leading up to the amateur radio contact with an astronaut on the International Space Station. The excitement of the entire experience was shared not just by the students, but included faculty, parents, the community, and local amateur radio operators. You will also learn how to begin the process 
of submitting your own ARIES contact proposal. This webinar is scheduled to be held on Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern, that's 1800 UTC. Technicians, there is life beyond repeaters. Hosted by Anthony Lucier, K8ZT. Maybe you just received your technician class license or perhaps you've had it for a while and burned out on sparse FM repeater contacts. Take a new look at the possibilities available to you beyond repeaters. Explore tech, HF, and 6 meter privileges for SSB, CW, and digital modes such as FT8, RIDI, and PSK31 to expand your operating modes at your station's outreach. Explore other VHF UHF uses, including SSB, satellites, FM simplex, digital modes, contesting, and more. This webinar is scheduled to be held on Tuesday, March 9th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC. The Art and Science of Operating Ultra Portable, hosted by Mike Molina, KN6EZE. Ultra portable operation, or being able to carry your radio over distances in a backpack, for example, is quickly growing in popularity. Whether it's for SOTA, POTA, backcountry survival, or just spending time in nature, learning how to operate ultra portable is a fun and rewarding experience. In this presentation, Mike, KN6EZE, will cover the basics of ultra portable operation for both the new and experienced TAM operator. This webinar is scheduled to take place on Tuesday, April 6, 2021 at 8 p.m. Eastern or 0100 UTC on Friday, April 7th. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change. The UK regulator Ofcom has announced that 53 community radio stations will receive emergency funding through the Community Radio Fund. During the COVID-19 pandemic, community radio stations have provided valuable local news and support to millions of people. However, many have also faced severe financial challenges. In response, the UK government announced emergency funding to help them meet the costs of continuing to provide these vital services to local communities. So far, 111 community radio stations have received financial grants totaling around £406,000. Due to the ongoing impact of COVID-19, an additional £200,000 was made available by the UK government for a third funding round. The Community Radio Fund panel, which acts independently of Ofcom, has now awarded this extra funding to 53 community radio stations across the UK, in accordance with the strict eligibility criteria and guidance issued. Ofcom has published details of the panel's approach and reasoning in deciding which applications receive funding. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a podcast at our website, www.twiar.net, and streamed worldwide via Spotify and iHeartMedia. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. There are times when tower jobs we need to do require helpers assisting us on the ground and with us on the tower. These are special situations which require higher than normal levels of communication between team members. When hauling coax, antennas, sidearms, or other hardware up the tower, never hoist hardware up the tower with someone underneath the cargo, unless they're wearing the proper safety gear and have been trained in tower work. Let's face it, on a tower, you don't get a second chance. There are at least three sides to each tower. So keep the lower climber on a different side, and besides, a freestanding tower is happier when you spread the load more evenly. So before you start to do tower work with other climbers and ground crew, stop, take a moment, and discuss with everyone exactly what you intend to do, the goals to accomplish, the order the tasks will be done in, special hardware you may need, and a discussion about hoisting things up and down the tower. The guy on the ground should always have the job of keeping sidewalk supervisors away from the base area of the tower. Even a quarter twenty, zinc plated not falling 80 feet onto the top of an unprotected skull can leave a permanent dent, not to mention a thud that will be ringing for hours in the victim's head. There's a good argument here for wearing a hard hat. Few hams I know of own one or even know where to buy one, so the next best thing is only one person climbing at a time. If climbing with a person already strapped on working above you, choose a different side to climb on. If you're already on the tower, but the antenna you need to work on is like six feet out on a sidearm, a different set of rules apply. 
it is most likely that the sidearm is fully capable of holding your weight as is. My personal rule is to never totally trust any part of the tower. This includes sidearms. So I bring along my trusty 15 foot strap. This yellow strap is very lightweight but fully capable of pulling a snowbound car out of a ditch. I attach one end of this strap to my harness and the other to a tower leg about five feet or more above the point where the sidearm mounts. This strap is strong enough to catch the full weight of the sidearm, myself, and my cargo. If you're expecting to work on a sidearm, I strongly recommend you invest in one of these rescue type straps. Not only did I want this series to offer safety tips, I also wanted to offer hints to make the job go faster and easier. The way I figure, an easier climb is bound to be a safer climb. So let's cover a couple of quick hints. For your tower work, attach them to a short piece of fishing line. Use the woven multi-filament type. Make it long enough to tie a wrist strap in the other end. And tie the other end to the tool you don't wish to drop. If you have a friend with a leather working hobby, a good Christmas present would be a whole bunch of these straps. You can keep your tools securely on your arm and in your hand with one of these straps. Remember to order them large enough to fit around your arm when you're wearing cold weather climbing gear. Another one of my favorites is my coaxial cable hanger. I bent the hook in a piece of reinforcing steel bar, the type used in concrete work and often sold at hardware stores. I bent a squared hook in one end, about three inches over and five inches back down, sort of like a giant fishing hook. I use electrical tape to hold the coax onto the rod that I'm bringing up the tower as I climb. I secure about two feet of the coax to the rod. As I climb, I reach down, grab the hook and lift it to a tower rung up as high as I can reach. Don't forget a short piece of rope to secure the coax hook to a loop on your climbing belt just in case you might drop it. Some people like to lift coax after they get to the antenna that it connects to. I've had problems with coax damage doing it this way, so this has worked fine for me. I stretch out the coax on the ground and the crew helps feed it up to me as I climb further. This would probably not work on very long lengths and may be unnecessary on shorter towers. Remember, any time you spend learning about tower safety is an investment in yourself. Education is a big part of tower safety. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. It's the U.S. and Canada against the world in the 2021 ARRL International DX Contest on CW, which takes place this weekend, February 20th and 21st. Join thousands of amateurs worldwide as they compete in this exciting international event. Whether you're a casual operator or just looking for DX contacts, an award chaser, or working on your DXCC, this contest offers something for everyone. U.S. and Canadian operators work as many DX stations and as many DXCC entities as possible on 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. DX stations work as many U.S. and Canadian stations and as many of the 48 contiguous states and provinces as possible. This means the DX will be looking for you. For 2021, ARRL has issued temporary accommodations for multi-operator stations in the contest, allowing them to adhere to local social distancing guidelines. This will open the door for many DX operators to participate in the contest while keeping their team members safe. Visit the ARRL contest webpage for rules and complete details. If you've been off the air for a year or so during your amateur career, you know that your first contact when you reactivate your stations has got to be a good one, especially if it's serious DX like this. The completion of a complicated upgrade of an aging antenna at the NASA Deep Space Network Antenna in Canberra, Australia has restored full contact between Earth and the Voyager 2 probe. The trailblazing spacecraft, which was launched 44 years ago by NASA, had been crossing the heavens in relative silence after a 70-meter dish there known as DSS-43 was shut down and dismantled for a needed refreshing. In space as on Earth, however, few things are immune to the impact of the global pandemic. The ordinarily large team of experts NASA would have sent to Canberra for the makeover was limited to four for safety reasons and the reduced size of the team delayed the upgrade's progress. With DSS-43 being the only antenna capable of communicating with Voyager 2, the probe had few options for communicating. It could only transmit to the smaller dishes in Canberra, 
but was unable to receive any commands, especially those that could have fixed problems if any had been detected on board. After a test message was sent last October, when DSS-43 was partially reassembled, NASA and other experts were optimistic. Now with DSS-43 back in business, the long silence is over, but two-way contact still requires something of a wait. Round-trip communications between Earth and the faraway deep space probe Voyager 2 currently takes 35 hours. The Daily DX reports that a team from Hellenic Amateur Radio Association of Australia is planning a November 3rd to 13th de-expedition to Willis Island, which ranks number 38 on Club Log's DXCC Most Wanted list. The group has put off plans to include a stint from Mellish Reef, last activated in 2017. With time away from jobs and consideration for the ops, Mellish is being put off to 2022, said team leader John Chalkorakis, VK3YP. The seven operators for this fall's de expedition will be from Australia and New Zealand. They're in the process of obtaining a permit from Parks Australia, which is required to camp at these Australian Coral Sea Marine Parks. Chuckle Rakis says the call sign VK9HR is expected to be renewed in August, but he's trying to get VK9W. VK9IR will be an additional call sign to be allocated, he said. The most important document is the landing permit, also from Parks Australia. No permit is required to visit these Coral Sea Islands for non-commercial purposes, but a permit application is needed to set up a campsite and to stay overnight on the island. The seven operator team plans to use verticals on 160, 80, 40, and 30 meters, while vertical dipole arrays will be used on 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10 meters. Activity is expected to be on single sideband, CW, and FT8 on 160 through 10 meters. The equipment complement is expected to be Kenwood TS-590S and ICOM IC-7300 transceivers with amplifiers on all. A de-expedition website and logo are in the works. Home to a meteorological station, Willis Island is in the Coral Sea off the northeast coast of Australia. Chakorakis also said that he and some friends have been trying to obtain a landing permit for Macquarie Island, VK0M, which is number 12 on Club Log's DXCC Most Wanted list, but he conceded that it's nearly impossible to get permission from the Tasmanian Parks and Wildlife Service because Macquarie is a protected nature reserve. Originating from Albany, New York, and distributed worldwide, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. The European Radio Amateurs Organization, Ureo, has announced a new party on the air, and the underlying slogan that goes with it this time is with a simple dipole. Remember, this is not a contest. It's just a radio meeting with a few simple rules which you might better call recommendations. A dipole is one of the easiest antennas to build, made up of just two pieces of wire cut to the appropriate length for the band to be used, a quarter wavelength on each side of the feed point. More sophisticated versions may include a ballon, but a ballon is not essential to the design. The simplicity of a dipole does not diminish the great success that it can produce, quite the opposite in fact. Try it and share with your colleagues, near or far away, and have some fun. The Winter Party will use all modes on the HF bands and runs from 00 hours UTC on February the 20th until 24 hours on Sunday the 21st. And you can find out more from www.ureo.org. Among the actions of the ARRL Board of Directors at its annual meeting last month, the League's policymakers recognized the Garden State Amateur Radio Association, which serves the public through the American Red Cross in Tinton Falls, New Jersey, which is in the ARRL Northern New Jersey section, but has many members in both the Northern and Southern New Jersey sections. The club also has an outstanding record of learning and education programs, including youth programs. The club was first affiliated as an ARRL-affiliated club on January 22, 1951, and celebrated its 70th anniversary of affiliation. The board also recognized the Boeing Employees Amateur Radio Society in St. Louis, which was first affiliated as an ARRL-affiliated club on May 6, 1971. The club has served the public and the Boeing community in St. Louis, 
by supporting various needs for radio communications in times of emergency, requests for support of public service events, development and training in the field of radio communications technologies, and the licensed amateur radio operators of the Boeing Company located in the metropolitan St. Louis area. The club has a long history of supporting the emergency preparedness activities of the Department of Homeland Security, Federal Emergency Management Agency, as well as state and local emergency management agencies through the provision of their VHF UHF repeater systems and HF communication systems for use in both actual and simulated emergency tests, such as top-off exercises and the great shakeout with highly effective and reliable systems. The ARRL board congratulated and recognized the Boeing Employees Amateur Radio Society St. Louis on the 50th anniversary of being an ARRL affiliated club. And finally, the board recognized the Amateur Radio Club of the University of Arkansas, W5YM, formed in 1916 with the call sign 5YM. The club continues to operate as a college club under the call sign W5YM and is a longtime ARRL affiliated club in the Arkansas section of the ARRL Delta Division. Emergency preparedness is the club's top priority. Each year, members participate in campus-wide disaster drills. These drills familiarize members in emergency procedures and familiarize public safety officials with the club's communications capabilities. The ARRL board congratulated and recognized W5YM on their 105th anniversary. In California, the SC4 Aries Group, part of the SC4 Amateur Radio Club of La Honda, Loma Max, Pescadero, San Gregorio, and South Skyline in the Santa Clara Valley section joined with the South Coast CERT members in late January. The groups performed a joint exercise to notify residents in the CZU Lightning Complex fire area of mandatory evacuations in front of a moderate atmospheric river event. Atmospheric rivers are columns of vapor that move with the weather, carrying an amount of water vapor roughly equivalent to the average flow of water at the mouth of the Mississippi River. When atmospheric rivers make landfall, they often release this water vapor in the form of rain or snow. Fire Chief Ari DeLay of La Honda Volunteer Fire Brigade, an SC4 Aries served agency, called together Aries and CERT leaders on January 24th to evaluate the areas to be evacuated. Angela Dragon, N6QAD, Bob Smith, W6RES, and Peter Chupity, KI6FAO, used mobile radio to assess likely relay spots in the mountainous terrain of the White House Creek, Gazos Creek, Butano Creek, Dearborn Park, and Loma Mar. They tested these areas using UHF as a stand-in for the general mobile radio service radios that CERT members would be using for the actual exercise. On January 26, the CERT and the SC4 Aries members met at Pescadero High School to deploy teams to warn evacuees and leave literature describing the nature of the incoming weather. The CERT members communicated with the Aries team and that team kept in contact with the Temporary Operations Center at the high school. In White House Creek Canyon, all CERT members were also hams, so no GMRS radios were needed. CERT and ARIES participants communicated with KI6FAO, perched on a hilltop, to relay the operations. The operation was a success, and the hourly rainfall rate didn't reach the threshold that triggered a reflow in any of the areas. Summits on the air, islands on the air, worldwide flora and fauna, and other radio-friendly outdoor activities will be the focus of discussion among young amateurs during the next Youngsters on the Air online session being held this month. It's being held by the Youth Working Group of International Amateur Radio Union Region 1. The program will begin at 1900 UTC on Thursday, the 25th of February. This episode is called Gone Exploring and shares different ways to enjoy outdoor activities. The Youth Working Group Chair, Philip Springer, DK6SP, writes on ham-yoda.com website that, as with previous episodes in the series, there will be a question and answer period afterwards. YOTA Online is a monthly presentation by Region 1's Youngest Amateurs. The events are live streamed on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook, and the organizers are also hoping to stream the proceedings via the Q0100 geostationary satellite in DA-TV mode. 
We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts. In Australia, one radio group has directed its problem solving towards hams unable to fulfill the regulator's requirement for a permanent address. Those countries' regulators, the ACMA, has a new requirement that hams in Australia provide a public postal address to be certified and licensed. This new requirement left some amateurs with a dilemma. They don't have a fixed address at the moment because they've been traveling, or perhaps in a vulnerable segment of the population. Leave it to Amateur Radio's ingenuity and problem solving to resolve the issue. The Pride Radio Group, created last year as a welcoming organization for amateur radio operators in the LGBTQ community, has arranged a free mail redirection service for its members in Australia. It provides a post office box that can be publicly listed and is separate from the address of AM's actual QTH. The Radio Group's founder, Michaela Wheeler, VK3FUR, said Pride is providing the mail redirection service free to its members. Michaela said the members receive an address to use on their registration paperwork. If mail arrives at that address, Hot Snail scans it and forwards it to the email address the HEM has provided. While this service cannot be used for QSL cards, Michaela says it does solve the address problem for the ACMA's required paperwork. Michaela said that because Pride Radio Group operates as a virtual entity, using Hot Snail made the most sense because the service can be managed remotely. And finally this week, word came late afternoon, and many watched it live on NASA television, the successful landing of the Perseverance rover. This latest rover will carry out experiments looking for signs of microbial life and will collect climate and geographic data. The rover carries three microchips, carrying 10,932 295 names from NASA's Send Your Name to Mars campaign. This is a tradition for NASA's Mars rovers. The agency's most recent Mars rover, Curiosity, carried a microchip with 1.2 million names. Also contained in the microchips are 155 essays from students who made it to the finals of the Space Agency's rover naming contest. That contest was won by Alex Mather, a 7th grader from Virginia. So we are happy to report that the names and call signs of some of the key staff members here at This Week in Amateur Radio are now on the surface of the Red Planet. Incidentally, the names and call signs of our staff members are also flying on the Parker Solar Probe now in orbit around the Sun. How's that for a DXQSL? For decades, NASA has been following a tradition called festooning, adding fun extras to spacecraft and rovers heading to the cosmos. Pioneer 10 and 11, two spacecraft launched into space in the 1970s, included a plaque that depicted Earth's location in the galaxies, as well as pictures of a naked man and a naked woman. The image was the brainchild of Carl Sagan, who wanted any extraterrestrial life who might find the spacecraft to know who we are and how to contact us. One of the objects included on Perseverance pays homage to this history. A plate fixed to the rover uses the same type of elegant line art used on the Pioneer plaque, this time depicting Earth, the Sun, and Mars, all joined by lines of Morse code reading Explore as One. Fans of geocaching, a treasure hunting game in which people use the global positioning system to hide and find treasures, will enjoy knowing that the rover team hid a special coin made of helmet visor material on one of the instruments. The NASA statement called it a geocache more remote than any other. The coin is part of the calibration target for the Sherlock, or scanning habitable environments with Raymond and luminescence for organics and chemicals instrument, and is etched with the address of its famous narrative namesake, 221B Baker Street in London. Sherlock is also adorned with a slice of Martian meteorite and four other samples of spacesuit materials. While it's cool to have some of NASA's spaceflight history on Mars, the Space Agency also included the spacesuit material to see how it holds up on the Martian surface. 
Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on amateur radio repeater systems, streaming on the Internet, or on great low-power FM broadcast stations like WGXC-FM, part of the Wave Farm on 90.7 MHz in Accra, New York, serving Greene County and the southern regions of New York's Capital District. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.